Welcome to KJ TV. In the studio today, we have uh, Dr. Rosalyn Akombe, uh, who is our guest here. Welcome, Dr. Rosalyn. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Rosalyn, now, um, I want you to tell me about yourself, who you are. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. And it's always nice to come back to, <laughs> to Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, of course, my name is Rosalyn Akombe. Komboka is my middle name. Yeah. I grew up in Kisi, okay. uh, Kisi town. That's okay. where I was brought up, in mm. Tayari to be specific. Okay. And uh, who am I? I'm a mother of two. Okay. Very proud mother of two children. <laughs> uh, but I'm also a professional uh, who works with the United Nations, been working with the United Nations since 2006, mm. but worked with the African Union before. Oh, you did? Uh, I did. I worked with the African Union. That was my first international job. Okay. Uh, but before that, I worked with the Women Rising, which mm. is a non-government organization that is based in Jersey City. Okay. I did that when I was a student. Uh, okay. I was doing my master's program at Rutgers University. Mm. And, but before that, my very first career was with the Collaborative Center for Gender and Development okay. in Kenya, oh, where okay. I worked on um, mostly uh, issues related to inclusion of women in democratic processes, inclusion mm. of women in the budget process in Kenya. Okay. And also it was the period when we were clamoring for the new constitution. Okay. So I worked on engendering the constitutional review process for, for women. So, I mean, I've, I've, I have a broad range of experience uh, mm. of working both with non-government organizations, working with uh, international organizations as the African Union, and the United Nations, Okay. But obviously, having served also my country as a commissioner okay. during the 2017 elections, uh, the IEC. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell us more about your position and your role in the UN. I really enjoy doing my job at the United Nations because it's, it's, it's very broad. I work as a chief of policy, okay. uh, planning and guidance in the mm. Department of uh, Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Mm. And uh, it's, it's broad in range because when you're dealing with policy issues, today you'll be dealing with multilateralism and the changes in multilateralism, and tomorrow you'll be working on things like climate and security and the impact. Okay. The other day you'll be dealing with prevention and mediation processes mm. in various countries. And, and, and so it's an interesting job. I get to travel a lot. Okay. I get to see different countries. I just came back from a long trip to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and then mm. I went off to, to Europe, various European cities. So it's, it's a job I enjoy doing because okay. it's a contribution to conflict prevention. It's a contribution to trying to make the world a better place to live in. Wow, that, that's a, a tough job. Now, you know, uh, this is something uh, many people ask, and I would want to ask you. I mean, you are among the first diaspora government uh, who has broken a ceiling, we can say, uh, in the capacity where you are working. Uh, how did you land in the UN? Uh, uh, because it's a, a place many people think they cannot go. Yeah, my working with the United Nations, actually, in a way, I look back and I say I was prepared to do the job from actually the work that I did when I was in Kenya, Okay. both as a student leader at the University of Nairobi, mm. but also working with the Collaborative Center for Gender Development, which I've already explained that I worked in. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, my working with the UN was really coincidental because mm. I was serving as the African Union uh, economist, working as an economist for the African Union. Okay. And in that job, uh, then between 2003, 2006, mm. I had to work very closely with colleagues at the United Nations. Okay. Because it was, I was working as an economist, but also working in explaining to UN colleagues about the new structures of the African Union at the time. Okay. And, uh, the UN was trying to understand the African Union. The African better. Union. Yeah. And so they had just created Kofi Annan, had mm. just created a program that was dealing with the uh, a 10 year capacity building program for the, for the, for for the, the African Afri Union. Okay. And they needed somebody who understood the, the African Union very well. Mm. And I was hired. Uh, I took okay. a risk, actually. Mm. I took a risk because I had a permanent job with the, with the African Union. Mm. I had, uh, I was an economist, hired as an economist, being paid well. I okay. Had, uh, I had life insurance. I mm. had, uh, I had, I, I was being paid well. Okay. But I had always wanted to work for the UN. In the UN. So they gave me a one-week contract. 
One I, week? Yes. <laughs> and you leave your permanent job? I left my permanent job at uh, the African Union to mm. take up a one week uh, job okay. with the United Nations. Mm. So that is why I think it's important for people to always see that you have to take risks. You have to for take you risks. to be able to advance, you have you gotta take some risks. Okay. And so I took the risk mm. of taking of leaving my permanent job with the African Union mm -hmm. and taking up a one week job with the with the United Nations and I'm still here. I'm still with the So UN. <laughs> what happened after one week? I would like to after, know. After after one week yeah. Uh, they decided that they wanted to do, you know, that I understood exactly what they were trying what to do. What they wanted. And they realized that I had the profile of the person they wanted to help um, mm. build the capacity of the, of, the, of, the, of the African Union because at the time mm. the African Union was trying to come up with its own Peace and Security Council, which was equivalent to the Security Council. So the UN Council, Council yeah. So they were putting up all these structures mm. and uh, the, the, the United Nations was willing to help them. Okay. But the United Nations itself didn't understand the African Union. The African Union. So I became kind of like an interpreter. Mm. Uh, and as an African woman, mm. uh, one of the very few African women, my boss at the UN at the time was actually a Finnish man okay. called Tapio Kaninen. Mm. So then he needed me because he needed to understand, to understand Africa. Africa. <laughs> but he also needed somebody who and who could speak to the African Union that's right. and who was trusted by the African Union. Okay. And so that's how I ended up uh, being renewed month after month, and I'm still and, there. And then you and I finally permanent. got a, a permanent contract, and I'm still there. So it's uh, so for me the big lesson for anybody who's trying to get to the Af to, to work with the African Union to mm. work with the international organizations. Is mm. be willing to take that risk. You know, sometimes it. that is that first step mm. is the one that we we are very uh, scared about doing. Yeah. But just take the risk, and and you'll be fine. And you <laughs> know, on the same note, I want to ask you. I read somewhere that uh, you left your UN job, mm -hmm. and you took a very big risk mm -hmm. to be a IBC commissioner in Kenya, mm -hmm. which was like seventy percent less salary. Mm -hmm. I, I must have read somewhere in an article. Mm -hmm. Is that true that you... Well, um, you know, the 70% <laughs> number came from members of parliament when they were grilling me because they basically look at your total income, okay. which is your total income before taxes, uh -huh. versus what you're going to get. Okay. So I, I, I don't want to say that it's 70%, <laughs> but it was a huge cut. It was a huge cut. Uh, yes, it is a risk that I took. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge risk that I took to leave my job at at the United Nations, which was a very good job. I was mm. working then as an advisor to the yeah. Under Secretary General for Political Affairs. Mm. Uh, it was a very influential job. I mm. was uh, working on very interesting files, Middle okay. East, uh, mm. uh, you know, working on Lebanon, the Middle East peace process. Yeah. It was a very interesting job that I was doing, and I was also then also uh, Deputy Chief of Staff yeah. uh, in, the, in the office of the, of the Under Secretary General. Okay. But I wanted something. I had done, I felt that I had worked you wanted in the international to venture community. Mm. I wanted to give back to oh, the give back. I felt that I had left Kenya when I was fairly young. Okay. I had left Kenya, you know, just a year after I had graduated from my oh. undergrad. Okay. So I felt that I had, you know, worked in Burundi, worked mm. in Afghanistan, worked mm. in Iraq. And that I needed to give back to my country. I needed to all these experience that I had okay. from elsewhere, from working on elections, from mm. observing elections, mm. that I could give a contribution back to my country. Oh. So that was really what motivated me. That that but, was very nice. Of yeah, you. yeah. So that's that that is a risk that I took of saying, <laughs> let me go give back to my country. That is very let true. Let me go serve my country. Mm. So what are some of the challenges you are faced to be where you are? Because we we see you here. We mm. thought you just came. I mean, I, I, I mean, to my people living in the diaspora, I mm. just need to say that uh, you can make it. I mean, I, when I started, when I came to the U.S. Mm. To, to do my studies, mm. of course, I did all the old jobs. Yeah. I worked as a security officer to be able to get the money to go to, <laughs> <laughs> to go to university. I yeah. was paid seven dollars twenty-five cents. You, know? you can imagine that. Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, those were you can have the financial hard you can get you know i was a single mother then i was mm. raising my daughter whom i had uh, i had you know i always say that i graduated from the university of nairobi with full owners yeah. including both in curricula and extracurricular <laughs> right? that's good so i had my daughter when i was still a university student okay and so 
here here I was in the U.S. Mm. Uh, doing my master's program, having mm. to get into doing all these old jobs, working in a group home, working as a construction worker oh. uh, with uh, my cousin Rena, who owned a construction company then. Okay. Uh, but those are the financial hurdles I, I had to go through. To the ones that you're running around and you, you have a little child and you have to figure out picking them up from daycare and, and you mm. know, all that. Uh, I mean, those are the ones you will always get. But also, mm. we face a country, you know, it, this is also a country that has its levels of racism. Mm. Uh, these are the, the countries, you know, organizations that I have worked in at the UN are not immune from racism. Mm. They are not immune from, you know, from their views of women and what okay. women can achieve. Okay. And so those are some of the hurdles I've had to face, mm. and especially as a young woman. Yeah. Uh, as a young woman working at the African Union, as a young woman working at the United Nations, it That's, was not easy. Mm. It was not an easy an easy one, but you learn to you learn to figure out the survival tactics okay. of how you you are able to advance your career without having to compromise on mm. anything, without having to compromise on your integrity. That's true. Mm. Now I don't know there is. Uh, a question I have to ask you. There was fake news which, which came and we were shocked. We woke up one morning mm -hmm. saying that you have been killed mm -hmm. in your apartment. Mm -hmm. It was news going over and we almost believed it. It's mm -hmm. like we were in a shock. People were trying to call to find out. Mm -hmm. And then there was another. How are you coping up with this fake news about you? I mean, it's uh, to me, frankly, the biggest. Uh, the part that I, that pains me most is the impact that it has on my family. Okay. Uh, for me, I have learned to expect that when you take a position, a public position, a public office, mm. you're going to be subjected to this. You're mm. going to be subjected to these um, rumors, to all sorts of fake stories. Mm. So I understand I am the one who applied for the job at yeah. the IBC Commission, right? Mm. I'm the one, I, I sought the job, I applied for it. Mm. So I deserve, to some extent, you mm. know, the things that are happening, happen. It's part of what it is to be in public service. Okay. What I don't accept mm. is the impact that it has to my family. To the fact yeah, that it was. Everybody, uh, you know, you have a family. big extended family. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> the, that time the world was coming to a standstill. Mm. More especially Minnesota, where yes. people seem to know you. Mm. It was like everybody was uh, calling. No, it was really bad also mm. because I was in a meeting. I was actually at the time when the rumors started going around. And, mm. and, they, and this is what really about when you look back at the impact of uh, WhatsApp mm. and, 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 and social media and the impact mm. that it has. Because it was not so much the, mm. the blog. Yeah. It was the fact that the dissemination of the news, of the fake news was through WhatsApp. Yeah. Which when people look at it, it looks real. It okay. doesn't look fake at all. Mm. Yeah, like it was real. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. looked real. So the, that impact on, you know, and I was in a meeting. I mm. was sharing a meeting with very senior officials. Mm. I couldn't make, take any calls. So nobody could confirm mm. or uh, say anything about, because everybody who was calling me, I was not answering the phone. Yeah. And so, because I was in a meeting and I didn't know what was going on around me. Okay. And so by the time people started looking, you know, by the time I answered the phones, mm. it had been about four hours in which you can imagine. it must be true. Because yeah, she's not even she's answering, not the, answering phone. the phone, yeah. Yeah, but I liked the latest one, frankly, the one about me having twins. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you, you wish you had the twins, but uh, <laughs> you know, don't you think it would have been nice that I, you know, at, uh, yeah, it's know, like it nice was. for me to be having twins at, at my age, but... Uh, <laughs> But too bad, you know. But you know that you never know. They are, they are wishing you well. Who knows? That, that's okay. That's that's better fake news than the one of saying I am dead. You know. Yeah, it, it, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I I don't know whether this this law um, which was passed in Kenya, President Uhuru has sent it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if including fake news. I think mm -hmm. that you cannot disseminate wrong information about mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I hope that will cut them down. But some of them uh, you can't find them. But uh, that's that's the problem, that yeah. attribution, being able to attribute. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I mean, that comes with public office. Yeah. Whenever you hold a public a public office, yeah. I mean, and I have had to have these discussions with my family mm -hmm. to explain to them that please understand that mm -hmm. I know this you didn't what... bargain, this is not what you asked for, yeah. but that's what you will be, you know, my children yeah. know that, mm -hmm. and, and I always have to tell them, 
be alert. Mm. Don't believe everything that you see. People say. Don't, don't believe everything that you see around. Yeah, and I, I think that is and it's, it's very good. And uh, what I can say, uh, what advice can you give to young ladies who want to advance in their careers? Because I, mm. I think you are, you are a better position mm -hmm. to advise. What advice can you give them? I mean, to the young people out there, both male and female, mm. mine is really to say, you know, identify what you want. Okay. Identify where your interest is and what you want to do and keep at it. Mm. There will be very many people that will come and discourage you okay. and, uh, and want to bring you down. You know, I remember when I moved to the U.S. Uh, mm. and, and I was, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, a lot of people were advising me that, uh, you know, I had I already had my bachelor's in education. Yeah. Uh, I knew that I was not going to be a teacher. Yeah. Uh, because I wanted to do, I wanted to explore, I wanted to do different things in life. Okay. And so when I came to the States, a lot of people were telling me to get into the nursing program. Uh -huh. And everybody was telling me, oh, that's the easiest way to be able to get a job. Yeah. But I knew I wasn't cut out to be a nurse. Okay, uh, yeah. Regardless of the fact that the job opportunities would be there. Mm. So it's to say to people that go for what you, you know, this what? country provides you, especially for those who are in the diaspora, this country provides you with immense opportunities. Yeah. And so instead of going and getting into a nursing program, I mm. got into doing my master's in, in global affairs, mm -hmm. specializing in political economy. Mm -hmm. I then did my PhD in the same area. Okay. And uh, I mean, I have become a better person because of the skills that I got. Yeah. So don't don't ignore. You know, if your passion is in, let's say, the arts, yeah. or just pursue them. Are, please pursue them. That's and, true. Uh, and sometimes your happiness will not come because of you know what is easy. That's if true. Everything that is easy mm. is not you know doesn't mean that that is what just that's what you, you want. But uh, but really to say you know the take risks you know don't yeah. don't be afraid to take risks okay. because if I didn't take the kind of risks that I have taken in my career mm. I wouldn't be where I am. That's you know, so do true. take the risks uh, and, and don't give up. That's true. Actually, you have been applauded by many people mm -hmm. um, in Africa and the diaspora as the woman of integrity. Mm -hmm. If if nobody has told you that's what uh, people take you. Uh, they know you take a stand mm -hmm. and you are a very honest person. So what can you say? Who influenced you to have that stand on integrity? No, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. I know I, I get asked about that and I, I don't think there's one single person, frankly, that I can look at and say, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's Wangari Madai or it's <laughs> one big figure out there. Okay. I think for me, it's how I was raised in my family. Mm. It's, it's, it, it comes back to the values that were imparted okay. in me, in my family set up. Okay. I grew up with the parents, my mother, we call her the Machiako, they are the family. Okay. Uh, really always instilled these values in us. My father was always very strict uh, mm. in terms of, you know, these are uh, things that belong to the public. They, mm. You know, you need to respect them. Mm. Honesty are things that, so these are values that you okay. brought up. But obviously, there are very many people I have read. I read. I love books. So okay, there are you do. Very many people that I have read and who have, who've inspired me in my life. There are okay. many of those, mm. um, and I get inspiration from 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 many of those. I mean, Wangari Madai, whom I mentioned earlier, okay, is one person we worked very closely with. Oh. My friends were mm. none of my friends in Kenya call my daughter by her name Joy. They all call her Karura. Yeah. Because uh, she was, I was expecting her when we were making the push to go and protect Karura Forest. <laughs> okay. Uh, so people like Wangari Madai are people who inspired us as young students mm. uh, and, and to whom we looked up to okay. for her courage, for her bravery. But mm. there are many others that I okay. want to, 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 to look up to. So I cannot talk about a single one person. Okay, okay. Now that uh, you talked about African Union, uh, I want to ask you, there's some, something trending about Ambassador uh, Giambori Kwai, mm -hmm. who was the African Union representative to the U.S., mm -hmm. whose term was terminated mm -hmm. uh, this month, mm -hmm. actually, yeah, October 7th. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually the diaspora has been petitioning uh, what 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 is your take on it? Or you are not allowed to talk about? It? <laughs> I mean, look, uh, 
mean, I, I have look, I have seen mm. all the news around about uh, uh, the ambassador's uh, remarks uh, mm. relating to what she perceives as continuation of the colonial tendencies yeah. um, of um, the former colonial masters. Yeah. I mean, she's entitled to her views as, a, as, 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 as an African. Okay. For which I think many would agree with mm. some of the fundamental principles that she, she has laid out in her speech. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the actions mm. that, uh, that, uh, that the, the African Union has taken, I'm, I'm not privy to all the okay. discussions that have been going around there, but I, I think it's, um, it is time, mm. it is important for us as, as Africans to interrogate these things. It's important okay. for us to have these conversations about the impact of colonialism and neocolonialism to our yeah. economies. Mm. You know, you look back at even now in a lot of our economies and you know, a lot of a lot of our countries, the issues that are being asked about how much debt we are taking in these okay. countries, mm -hmm. how much how much, you know, reliance, external reliance we mm. have as, as as African countries. So I think that is an interesting debate that she it, has put out it there. Is there a really, it is a really interesting um, uh, debate he has put on. Mm -hmm. Actually, I didn't know, even myself, uh, it was an awakening. Although the only thing I know is Haiti, the story I knew about Haiti and France, mm -hmm. where in 1804 the slaves got independence, and then later on they were obligated, Haiti, for many years they were paying a colonial debt to, mm -hmm. to France. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that was in Africa. Mm -hmm. But then, what do you think the diaspora should do or uh, uh, about uh, the debate you started? I mean, I think it's important that we also, you know, first educate ourselves, right, with the exactly. facts of, 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 of what it is and what, what is going on in the, in the African countries. It's just really important that we do that. Mm. But I think it's also, you know, we have a voice yeah. as diasporas, whether we are the diasporas in the former colonial masters in, yeah. in the UK, in France, or Portugal, yeah. or, or whichever place we are, mm. I think we have an opportunity to be able to, you know, because we, we can't say things that our governments cannot say, right? Yeah. We can't raise these issues in ways that our governments cannot tell, cannot cannot raise, because in some of those places, at the, as the, the diaspora, we are citizens of those countries that were, you know, yeah. we have we have Kenyans and, and, and Nigerians who mm. end up becoming British citizens. So yeah. they can voice these things as, yeah. as British citizens in yeah. the diaspora. They mm. can raise these issues as French citizens uh, coming from Senegal and things like that. So I think we have an opportunity as a diaspora to, do that. to really raise these things and raise the profile and ask these tough questions about the relations, the, the yeah. colonial relationship. Mm. Now that you worked with the African Union, mm. supposing they approach you that they want you to be the ambassador, to replace Jamboree. I'm not saying they will do that. Will you accept that job? I mean, I'm currently really enjoying what I'm doing. I'm <laughs> currently enjoying really working, working very hard. I have some of the best staff in both my policy planning uh, okay. side of the house and my guidance and land unit. We do lots of interesting work with regional organizations. As I said, I was in Ethiopia mm. a few uh, days ago working with the IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority for Development, working okay. with them on their early warning mechanisms. Mm. I enjoy doing that. Okay. I enjoy going out and uh, raising funds mm. for deployment of peace and development advisors who really advise, provide political advice mm. to resident coordinators in more than 50 okay. countries. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy doing what I am doing for now. And, uh, now, now that you have that experience about policy, mm -hmm. um, you come from Kisi, mm -hmm. and uh, if I can quote the retired uh, uh, Prime Minister, I mean, I don't call him retired, but he, he was Rai Rodinga, mm -hmm. had raised one point about Kisi. Mm -hmm. He said that Kisi is going to be a rural slum. Mm -hmm. uh, like, we are so congested, we are, the plots are becoming so small. Mm -hmm. Now, with your experience, what is your take? What can we do to avoid having a rural slum in Kisi because of population? I mean, I think population is not, high population is not a bad thing in, mm. its, in itself. Yeah. Uh, in 
and, and, and talking about Kisi County. I come from Imira County, so it's should, both. Uh, okay. When <laughs> we should, talk Kisi, uh, we, we mean yeah, both. I come from both. Uh, I come from Yamira County. I but you in lived Kisi in Kisi County, <laughs> and now where I call home is actually Kisumu County. Okay. Uh, but uh, but I think we have an opportunity with the devolution. Mm. We have an opportunity to develop these counties. We have yeah. an opportunity to use the capacity we have elsewhere to plan better because okay. that is a problem. Okay. It's really that uh, we're not using the skills that are there for planning. Mm. We, you know, we can see where we are heading as, mm. as, 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 as all these different counties. Mm -hmm. But we're not using the, the, the knowledge that we have to plan better, okay. to be able to look at housing and, mm -hmm. and, and, and expand. I mean, the, the land use policies, I mean, it is time that we stop oh, the subdivision, the endless subdivisions of land. Yeah. Uh, and that is a problem. That is knowledge. That is something that we need to be educating our people and saying that it doesn't help for you to keep subdividing, subdividing the land. The there land. are ways in which you can use this land mm. without having to subdivide it into small, small pieces that end up having no economic value mm. because you can't really produce much from a, a half of a quarter of a piece and of that's land. That's very true. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I, it was nice to talk to you. Thank you very and, much. And uh, I. I want to say, do you have any closing remark to say uh, before we close? No, I mean, thank you so much, Dr. for this opportunity. Mine is really to keep uh, encouraging our people in the diaspora, the, mm. Kenyan, the Kenyans in the diaspora, the Africans in the diaspora, mm -hmm. and say that we have an opportunity to build our communities, we mm. have an opportunity to build our countries, whether mm. you define the countries as the U.S. or you can define the countries as Kenya mm. and others. We have an opportunity. We, we have been... You know, blessed to be in a country in which we can give much more back to Kenya, yeah. we can give much more back to the communities that we are mm. we are in and uh, there are many ways that we can, you know, we need to start working together to see how we use the various capacities that we have mm. and to encourage the young men mm. and women who are out there who are still struggling mm. that you can make it. I mean, I, you know, made it from being a construction worker, <laughs> from being a, yeah. a security uh, officer from working in a group home uh, <laughs> as a student in the yeah. US mm. and, and and see here I am now uh, so you can make it uh, you just have to keep at it keep your eye to the goal thank you very much thank you. and I wish you the best of luck thank you so much thank you